What's up, everyone? How you doing? It's another episode of Coffee with Colin. I am Colin Egglesfield, and I'm broadcasting from my mom's place here in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, thanks for joining me again for an exciting, inspiring conversation with a guest who I've known for, gosh, it's been about 20 years. Uh, he is someone who I actually started doing some modeling work with uh, when I first started out in the amazing, crazy world of fashion. So we're going to be talking about fashion. We're going to be talking about, uh, he's got three books out. Um, he's going to be telling us more about those. And uh, he's someone who's just been uh, incredibly resilient. And speaking of agile artists, he's been someone who's been able to pivot in several different arenas with his career, starting out as a model. Um, he's also now a fashion stylist. He's styled Sharon Stone, Justin Timberlake. Um, he's actually produced a, uh, a mini series on YouTube. And with these three books now that are out on Amazon, he's going to be talking to us about what was the impetus and the inspiration for him to uh, write these books. These, these are beautiful coffee table books and uh, they make amazing gifts. And he's going to tell us more about what it was that uh, made him want to put these together and celebrate women in fashion and in acting and in the music industry. And uh, as I mentioned, he was someone who uh, was discovered actually by the same woman who discovered Cindy Crawford in Chicago. So we're both from Chicago and uh, he's going to tell us about how he got discovered. And for all of you aspiring models out there, he's going to give some insight on what it takes to be a successful model in the fashion industry. The industry has completely changed over the past 20 years since we started, but because he's in it and knows it really well, uh, he can tell you a lot about what it is that uh, separates the people that make it like the Giselles and the high fashion supermodels that are out there and uh, the people that are just not maybe able to make it onto those uh, biggest stages in the world like we've seen from these some of these supermodels. And then I'm going to ask him a little bit about what happened to the supermodels. doesn't seem like there's so many supermodels anymore. And uh, we're going to just pick his brain about the world of fashion. So as always, would love your input and your questions. So you can type in on the side here. We've got audiences from LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. If you are on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel so you're never missing another episode of Coffee with Colin. And as always, uh, as always with the show, I love to share inspiring insight to share with my audience ways that we can overcome any challenges um, or objections that may, we may be facing in our life to pursue our goals and our dreams because what I've realized as an actor that going over 2000 auditions in my acting career, there's a lot of no's that you are going to face in life. And if you are going to let any one of those no's stop you from fulfilling on your dreams and your goals, you're missing out on some amazing things out there. It's not always easy. And that's why I like to have my guests on here to share with us some of their, some of their insights and their strategies on how they overcame some of these uh, obstacles and challenges in life to get to where they're at. Um, and it's interesting how the universe works. You know, I'm here at my mom's place here in Chicago and, uh, the mug that I picked for this evening happens to have the engraving of be here now. I don't know if you can see, actually it's too bright for you to see this, but it says be here now. And so I'm appreciative that you guys are all here with me right now. And if you're not able to be with me here live now, of course, you can always watch this episode again because it'll live live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bring to the stage Mr. Marcellus Reynolds. Everyone. <laughs> Wait, what? okay, there I am. <laughs> I'm center. I'm front and center. Ah. <laughs> oh. How are I love, you? I love the mug. Got your Thank issue you. on. Awesome. Listen, I'm obsessed with myself, so everything has an M on it, or my initials MR. <laughs> awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, so, man, as I uh, I mentioned, we started out in the modeling industry, what was it, probably uh, twenty over 20 years ago. Colin, um, it's almost 30 years. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, you don't need to go that far. But, I yeah. wish it was 20 years ago. It was like... It was, wasn't it like, I think I started a little bit before you because uh, I think I was going when I met you. Um, we had friends in common and I had already done maybe a season or two with Stephanie uh, and her sister, Megan. Um, but that was like, I got discovered in, 19, in 1995. I started in 95, so yeah. Okay. And you got discovered by 
by uh, the same woman who discovered Cindy Crawford. Right? <laughs> I love that, so. like, that little bit of Marcellus trivia. <laughs> um, yeah, I got discovered by a woman in Chicago named Marie Anderson. She was the same woman who discovered Cindy Crawford. She discovered so many amazing people during her career. She was like the vice president of Elite Chicago for years, and then she stepped down and started her own agency, Aria. And that's where she found me when she had started Aria. And I think, and you were an Aria boy as that's, well when you started. Yep. We all that's started amazing. through Aria. So yeah. many amazing, so much amazing talent came through Aria. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the Riker brothers who did really well, Shakara Dart did really well. She was an Aria girl, Charlotte Dodds. Oh God, Charlotte Dodds, mm -hmm. that face of an angel. Um, Oh, the, the list goes on and on. I think, oh, I'm not going to say Leah, but I don't think Leah was an Aria girl. But there's so many people came through Chicago. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was so yeah, much yeah. talent that, like, somehow came through. At that point, it was Aria. Uh, Ford wasn't even in Chicago yet. It was Aria, Elite. And then I think there was an agency called... Uh, David and Lee, and then there were like littler agencies, but all of the agencies had great talent. Yeah, yeah. And what I, you know, I always liked about you is, as someone who was new into the fashion industry, I had no idea what the frick I was doing. I had no idea who, like, who Bruce Weber was, or, uh, I mean, Versace. I called it Versace, you know. And um, <laughs> I remember I was, I'd be flipping through magazines, and uh, you know, that Donna Care in New York, DKNY. I thought that was. I thought you pronounced that Dacne. I was, I was just like, I had no idea what any of this was. Um, but what I always admired about you was that you always seemed so certain and so confident about whenever we would go to these castings together. Um, it always seemed like you just had a, a vision or an idea of what it took to be successful as a fashion model. And uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, was this something that you had always aspired to do from an early age or was this something... That um, because you know, like for someone like Marie to just discover you, there had to be some sort of like idea that this was something that maybe was in the uh, the realm of possibility for you. Um, do you feel like you attracted Marie into your life, or how did how did this whole fashion thing start out for you? Well, I was working my way really slowly through uh, college, and I was waiting tables. So I have that crazy origin story that you hear so often. Oh, I was a waiter at a restaurant and I got discovered, but I did get discovered. I was waiting tables at a restaurant called Marche, which was a really big, hot, happening restaurant in Chicago. That's right. And um, talk about the universe. I wasn't even supposed to work that day because I didn't work. I was like spoiled. Um, I was modeling, so I had to have my days free. Mm -hmm. And I didn't work lunches, but you had to work at least one lunch to keep your job at Marche. Like that was the trade off. Okay. So I was working my penance lunch and I walked up to the very first table it was three women, one of which was Marie. And mm. as soon as I walked up, they looked up at me and they were like, oh my God, you're very attractive. You should be a model. And I was like, not in the mood. I was like, have the salmon. Like I was like given that <laughs> energy. And then I think, and they laughed when they said you should be a model. And then, and then I was like, whatever. And then Marie was like, no, when she, cause it wasn't Marie that first said it. It was the, her partner, Mary Bonesher, who said it. Mm -hmm. And then Marie looked at me and she was like, when she says you should be a model, you should be a model. And they all pulled out their cards and they all owned model agencies. <laughs> Marie and Mary owned Aria and the other woman owned the agency in St. Louis called Centro. Mm -hmm. But to your point, I didn't, I knew about modeling because Chicago was a big city for modeling and I knew a lot of models. I didn't think it was something for me because I, because I was short. So it wasn't like, oh, I grew, I grew up thinking, oh, I'm going to be a model, but I definitely grew up thinking, oh, I'm going to be an actor. And I definitely grew up thinking, oh, I'm special. So, um, so there was always that in my head to counteract the narrative that had gone on growing up that I wasn't special and I wasn't deserving of a lot of things because I was growing up black mm. in the South side of Chicago and because I grew up gay. So mm -hmm. I had to have this like constant stream of bravado going in my head. I had to believe harder maybe than anybody else that I was fabulous and that I was fantastic because I was counteracting all this other stuff 
that I was being told by everybody else. I was being told as a black man in the in the United States that I wasn't worthy or that I was uh, mm -hmm. bad. And then I was being told by my community of black people that I was um, undeserving and bad because of my homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So there was something about me growing up that I was like, fuck you, you're wrong, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I always had to have that. And I always think I, you know, I always led with my chin up. You know what I mean? I always walked with my chin up. I always, because I was, I grew up on the defensive, right? From all sides. Mm -hmm. I always kept my back straight and my chin up. And I would be like, you know, I always had this mant mantra sort of, um, you could beat my ass, but you can't beat my outfit, right? So every <laughs> room I walked into, I walked into like I owned it, like I deserved to be there. And it was literally bravado. It was literally mm -hmm. me like working against this idea that I didn't feel good enough, that mm -hmm. I didn't feel um, that I was being told that I was all the things that were wrong with me. And I think that's what, maybe Marie and Mary and the woman from Centro saw when I walked up to the table, this like, you know, of course the cheekbones, of course the bone structure, you know, the skin, the teeth, the, the, the. but um, I think they also saw this like, uh, this, uh, I call it bravery. Right. Some people would call it arrogance, but I call mm -hmm. it bravery in the mm -hmm. face of like a lot of criticism. Yeah. And, you know, I took that with me everywhere I went, and that got me really far. And was it was it direct communication saying that there was something like you didn't belong, or that there was something wrong with you, or was it more just kind of pervasive in your culture? Um, was it like people would actually to your face tell you that there was something wrong with you, or was it just kind of? Oh, like you know, I let's let's be very clear. I grew up being told. I mean, my mother told me I was an abomination. Really? I grew up in the black church and it seemed like every time, every Sunday when we went to church, no matter what the sermon was, in my mind, it always came back to, you're gay, you're going to hell. Wow. Um, I was horribly bullied as a child. Mm. I mean, I was like, it was like a war zone when I left the house. Really? Before I even knew who and what I was, because of how I was, it was assumed that I was gay. Yes, I was sensitive. Yes, I was empathetic. Yes, I was kind. Yes, I was really well-spoken. And those things that may be in white children or in a uh, white society or in affluent school, in affluent mm -hmm. schools mm -hmm. would have been a plus. In black schools and poor neighborhoods, those things separated you out. Mm. And they made you a target. Mm. And so I was horribly, horribly bullied by my own people. I grew up in a house full of boys, though. There were three of us. I had a, boy, a brother that was like two years younger than me and a cousin that was a year younger than me. So I grew up fighting, like little boys fight. It wasn't like, mm. you know, it wasn't malicious, but little boys fight. You know, give me that yeah. toy. Duh, duh, duh. So I grew up fighting. So at first bullies would come to me or somebody would say something to me and I would, I would lash out, I would fight back. Mm -hmm. And then once the bullies figured out that he was a fighter, then it was never one bully. It was never, it was always two, three, you know? Mm -hmm. And so from a very early age, I was either running home or I was fighting, you know, cause mm -hmm. people say, would say the most horrible things to me. And I felt all of those things. I felt everything, every time you said, every time you called me a slur, I felt it, you know, so. And did you have anyone to turn to? Like you said, it didn't seem like your mom was supportive. What about, was your father in the picture at all? I never met my father. I'm literally the, like the stereotypical uh, story you, you want to hear about black people, which so often is not true. Um, you know, I looked around and most of my friends had you know, a nuclear family. They had fathers in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, even my cousins, you know, had fathers in their homes, you know, I did that kind of thing. But I was that kind of stereotypical thing you think about Black people. My mother was, uh, had three children. All of us had different fathers. I never met my father. We were on welfare. Mm -hmm. However, 
my grandmother and my grandfather owned the building that we lived in. And my grandfather owned a very small construction company. And so my grandmother and grandfather were, I would say, middle class. And, you know, my grandfather got a new Buick Deuce and a Quarter every, you know, two or three years, maybe every five years and giant, mm -hmm. you know, black Buick and um, drove that car very, pr very proudly and, you know, washed it and polished it, you know, on Sundays. Mm -hmm. um, and my grandmother was like the one I was the very first grandson. So I was pampered on her end. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the stuff that was going on on the outside, my grandmother knew about. So she did things for me that counteracted that. Mm -hmm. Like she would say things to me, like before I left the house in the morning, she would say, you are magnificent. Go be magnificent. So when I get into the streets and somebody would call me a fag or a Gacy, I would be like, I'm not. I'm magnificent. My grandmother says so. Mm. And, you know, my grandmother, like, knew that I loved clothes, so she was always bought me things. And she fed into that, too, because maybe if I wasn't so well-dressed and clean <laughs> when I was, like, a little boy and turned out properly, you know, maybe I wouldn't have been, you know, so targeted. But, like, I loved clothes, and my grandmother and I would go shopping together from a very early age, and it would just be us. Mm -hmm. And she taught me about My grandmother shopped at Marshall Fields. Mm. And we would go on Saturdays and 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 she taught me about fashion. You know, my grandmother had like multiple salespeople on multiple floors at Marshall Fields <laughs> and they knew her name. Amazing. You know, my grandmother was that girl. My grandmother wore furs back when it was okay to wear furs. Yeah. And she would be like, you know, uh spring would happen. And she would be like, oh, we have to go put the furs in the storage. It's getting warm. <laughs> and then fall would happen and she would be like, you know, the first hint of like, cool. She would be like, ooh, is that a chill? And I'd be like, yes. And she'd be like, we've got to go to the fur ball. And she would go get her furs out of storage. And I just loved all of that. And I loved mm -hmm. like shopping with her. I'd be in the dressing with her room with her. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, mama, cashmere. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Amazing. Um <laughs> So she Amazing that you had her to uh, to support you and just instill in you that confidence. Um, I've got quite a few friends who talked about how it was difficult for them to uh, acknowledge their their homosexuality, and it was difficult for them where they would try to hide it and they struggled with actually admitting it or coming out. Was that something that uh, was it was difficult for you, or was did you know at an early age? That uh, that you were homosexual and that you were um, um, accepting of it, or did you try to resist it at all? Or okay, so I'm going to say something, and I've said it before, and people literally roll their eyes because of the way that I was socialized by my community. I sometimes wonder if I if I'm really gay. How so? Follow this. If you if you're told from the time you're like five years old, before you even like girls or boys, that you are something, and it's mm -hmm. drummed into you at every turn, do you are you really that? Right. So before mm -hmm. I even had feelings about girls or boys, I was told that I was gay in the most horrible vernacular mm -hmm. and in the most horrible way possible. So yes, I attached a great deal of shame to it. Okay. You know, in the black community, the worst thing you could be is gay. You could be a gang member. You could be a murderer. You could be a deadbeat dad. You could be all these horrible things and your family would forgive you. I had an uncle who was a drug distributor and went to jail for like 25 years to life. And we would get on the bus and we would drive two, three hours to Joliet to see him. He could be forgiven for that, all the crimes that he committed. Hmm. But my gayness was the thing that was unforgivable within my family. To this day, I don't speak to my brothers, my brothers, my flesh and blood brothers from really? that I grew up with because of my homosexuality. Um, I still have issues with my mother because she, she loves me in spite of my homosexuality. 
and I don't want to be loved like that. Mm -hmm. I want you to love all of me, especially when my homosexuality is concerned, because I fought so hard for so long to accept myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that my homosexuality is part and parcel to who I am. And it's part mm -hmm. of why I'm so successful as a human being. Mm -hmm. I consider myself an artist. I've always considered myself an artist. And part of my um, being an artist is my homosexuality. Maybe the fact that I pick up on things that other people don't pick up on. Maybe I see things in a way that maybe other men don't see them. And so um, my family has also benefited from my largesse because I've been successful. I started working when I was 14 years old. You're not supposed to work in Chicago until you're 16. Mm -hmm. And from the time I was 14 years old, well, let's say from the time I was 15, I was the breadwinner in my house. My mother was on welfare. I was paying the bills. I was keeping the lights on. Wow. I was putting food in my brother's belly. So now that they don't speak to me, it's actually a really bitter pill for me to swallow because I kept you alive from the time that I was like 14 until the time I left home, probably 18 to 19. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, um, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing for me because the things that, that made me special, and I think that my homosexuality made me special, was mm -hmm. the thing that made me money. You know, I was the salesperson. That's what I was doing for a living when I was 14. Mm. I got hired to be a stock boy at like this really chic women's store. But I was like the boy that was selling clothes while screwing in a light bulb or dusting or vacuuming. Women would come up to me and they would be like, what do you think of this? And I'd be like, yes, you know, it comes in pink also. Well, girl, you could go a size down in that. And my manager saw that and she was like, put the feather duster down. Let's, <laughs> let's train you to become a salesperson. And I'm forever grateful to her for that because she changed my life in that moment. She mm. saw something in me at like 14, 15 years old that gave me a way to make money. Mm -hmm. And it taught me a love of fashion and it taught me a love of people and it made me able to go into a room and talk to anybody. You know, when you're a commissioned salesperson, you have to figure out, you have to assess people really quickly. You have to figure out how to sell them something. They mm -hmm. cannot leave that store without buying a pair of earrings. You know <laughs> what I mean? They have to buy something. And she gave me that. And so I took that, like you said, into rooms with me. You know, I walked into yeah. a casting and would talk to the casting director and would talk to everybody there. So much of my success, even as a model back then, wasn't the fact that I was like the best looking or the tallest. It was that I had this great personality mm -hmm. and people would be like, oh, if he's like that on set, if he's like that in front of the camera, book him, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, that says a lot about who you are and. Uh, I'm not sure if you're seeing the comments on the side here, but uh, got a lot of love over here. And uh, Sibyl says, "Why am uh, I not know? seeing the comments?" So, oh, because I still have a private chat. And now I'm. There you uh, go. Now yeah, I, I see the, the comments. comments. Oh, button. I see the comments. Oh, there's so many. Yeah. Sibyl <laughs> so, says, "We are art, regardless of what people may think. It is a confession of how they feel about themselves." This is referring to your brothers and everyone else who, who uh, criticized you and where there, uh, where there is judgment, there is sadness, frustration, and self-hate. And, you know, this is the thing where um, because of the cultures that, you know, we grow up in, I grew up about an hour or about a half hour south of where you actually grew up. And when I was growing up, whenever I would go downtown and I actually went to go see Cindy Crawford at Marshall Fields, because she was making an appearance there in my had my uh, my mom or dad I can't remember who it was write a fake dentist note to give to my school <laughs> and my my uh, buddy Brian Timponi and I we drove down to go see Cindy Crawford at Marshall Fields and we got her autograph and you know we got to play hooky and, you know it was a fun time but where I grew up we were always told whatever you do don't ever find yourself running out of gas in the South Side of Chicago. So that's what I grew up with. The messaging of the South Side of Chicago is dangerous. It is a place you do not want to end up. And so one day, sure enough, we uh, were driving back from Chicago after prom. This is myself, my girlfriend, and my 
two buddies and their girlfriends and we were running out of gas and we had to pull off into the south side of Chicago to get gas. And the whole time, I swear, we were like, lock the doors. Well, you know, there's the criminals are going to run up to us and, and try to rob us. And, and we get this messaging um, that fast forward, like 20 years later, when I started to rehab houses in the south side of Chicago, um, I was like, this is this is all made up. This is I mean, now, don't get me wrong. There are pockets and parts of any part of any city that are dangerous and that you don't want to be going to. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think we get this messaging sent, you know, we grow up with certain types of messaging that really can alter the way that we look at the world, look at people um, that can create these types of just divisive um, ways in which we look at people and accept people. And I just, I got to give you a lot of, of, uh, of credit for just not letting that stop you and not letting that bitterness make you take it out and create more bitterness in the world that you've actually used that and turned it into your passion for art and fashion. And I just got to tell you, you are so inspiring, Marcellus, for who you are, what you stand for, and what you're doing. I just, it, it means a lot to, uh, I'm honored just to even have this conversation with you and have, you know, you share your message. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, we've known each other for so long and through so many incarnations, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're right, that, that messaging is damaging because think about your like, don't stop on the South Side, it's filled with criminals. The messaging that, that I received from being Black, a young Black man, is that you don't have the opportunities that other people have, right? Mm. And so what do you do? You know, what do you do when you're not given the opportunities, when when life isn't fair, when you've been redlined and only have to live, you can only live in certain areas, when you don't have the opportunities, you don't get to go to the better schools, you don't get to uh, sort of succeed. And in the it became like a self-fulfilling prophecy also, because you would think that you would grow up and be told and because you're being told this by white society or greater society, you would think that black people would fight against that. But so often in my experience growing up, because I was smart, smart, because I was verbal, it was almost like a thing to be ashamed of to be smart, a thing to be ashamed of to speak well. One of the things that used to get me so much in trouble with my peers growing up was this idea that you talk white. And that was because my grandmother and I would sit on the sofa and we would watch movies like The Philadelphia Story, or we would watch Top Hat, or we would watch these great old movies that were about dialogue, that were about conversation. And, you know, I learned how to like conjugate a verb properly. I don't know why that <laughs> I picked that up, but I did. And yeah. I used words that I heard in movies. And my grandmother was the kind of person that if you asked her a question, she would be like, go get that encyclopedia I spent all that money on and figure it out. And when you figure that out, you come tell me. So if I asked her, like, where's Italy? Because I saw mahogany and I remember this to this day. Dinah Ross went to mahogany. She left the south side of Chicago. Dinah Ross and mahogany left the south side of Chicago and working at Marshall Fields. And she went to Rome. And I remember asking my grandmother, I was like eight years old. And I was like, Ma, where is Italy? And she <laughs> lost it. She was like, if you don't get that I encyclopedia, and when you figure it out, you come in here and you read it to me so that when you find out, I'll know. <laughs> and now I think of that, when I think of that now, those days, she was giving me the greatest gift possible because I don't know that my grandmother could read or read well. Mm. So she had me reading to her all the time. Okay. She had ebony, essence. No, she every now and then she would have essence, but she had ebony, jet, and black enterprise on her cock on her dining on her cocktail table in her in her living room. Mm. And we would sit on her plastic covered couch <laughs> and she would be like, Boy, read me this magazine. And I would read her the magazines from cover to cover. And when I tell you cover to cover, I would have to read her the cover art on the magazine. Mm -hmm. Then I would turn the magazine and I would read her the masthead on the magazine. And it was publisher, John H. Johnson. It was art director. It was director of photography. It was this, that, all, you know, all these other oh. things. Mm -hmm. And what that did for me 
was it opened my eyes to this idea that black people could in, in, inhabit all of these spaces, right? Mm -hmm. So a black person could publish a magazine. A black person could be a photographer. They could be an art director. And then the further I got into the magazine, black um, Ebony was all about black success. So there were black debutantes and there were black doctors and there were black politicians and it really covered black life in the same way that Life Magazine covered white life because it's Life Magazine certainly didn't cover black life. Mm -hmm. Ebony Magazine was the black life magazine. And yeah. I remember even being young and seeing like stories about Iman and Beverly Johnson and Pat Cleveland. I remember this one article where it said that Beverly Johnson made $5,000 a week as a model. And I remember thinking, and she had a penthouse in New York. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh my God, she <laughs> makes $5,000 a week. They had no idea what $5,000 was, but because they said she makes $5,000 a week, I was like, that's a lot of money. You know what I mean? <laughs> And I always loved models yeah. and fashion because of that. And so, you know, I, I, I'm thankful to her for that gift. I'm thankful yeah. to her for the gift because it set me up for what I am now. Because I had to do research to even talk to her. Mm. I couldn't ask her questions like, why don't zombies eat each other? Yeah. Like every time I asked her like a question, she literally would be like, go get me <laughs> So was that the plan to... Is that what planted the seed for you in terms of seeing what was possible? Because I think a lot of, like you said, a lot of people get this messaging that they there's a, a ceiling of what they're capable of doing in life. Um, I guess looking back at where you were at as a kid, uh, what advice would you have given yourself uh, to help move through or navigate what you were experiencing back then? Mm, God, there's so many things. You know, I think there were times in that period where I literally tried to make myself invisible. Like I literally just wanted to disappear. Hmm. Anytime I wasn't in my grandmother's house, I wanted to disappear. Anytime I was out in public or in school or around my peers, I, I, I never felt safe. Mm. And I mean, I would pray to be invisible. And so I would tell baby Marcellus to never dim his light, mm. to never be afraid. Somebody else's bad behavior is not your fault. Love it. That's great advice. That's great advice. And, you know, especially having your grandmother there as that, uh, that connection to uh, you seeing what's possible, seeing some of these role models, who would you say are some of your, your biggest role models that helped you now achieve what you've achieved in life? Okay. So I'm going to tell this story about my childhood. So I was incredibly theatrical and you know how like there's always the school plays, you know what I mean? So I always wanted to be an actor, but I think that was because my grandmother and I watched all these movies mm -hmm. and I couldn't go outside. So I spent a lot of time in the house watching movies, watching television. And while I was watching movies and watching television, I was looking for the black person because if I saw a black person doing something that was added to the list of the things I could be. I knew I didn't want to be a maid because those old movies are tr are troubling cuz you know those you know every all the black people in the old movies from like the 40s and 50s even the 60s were like you know maids or or valets uh uh valets uh so I, you know I knew I didn't want to do that I was I wanted to be the person that was waited on I didn't want to be the waiter mm -hmm. um but I think there was this vista into a world of, of, of what do I want to do and how do I want to be it? And I knew I wanted to be an actor or I knew I wanted to perform. And I think that was because I wanted to be seen in a positive light. Mm. So often I was being seen negatively and I wanted to be seen the way that I saw myself. 
So I would audition for every single school play. I auditioned for The Wiz and I could not sing. <laughs> I, but I wanted to be the cowardly lion because that was like kind of the biggest part in The Wiz other than Dorothy and I couldn't audition for Dorothy. Um, but every year I would audition for every play and the big part in Black plays is always Martin Luther King. And every year I would be like, I'm Marcellus Reynolds and I'm auditioning for the role of Martin Luther King. And I'd go in there and I'd be like, and I'd do the I Have a Dream speech, which I had like practiced in front of the mirror for like hours. My poor family has to listen to this. And I'd be like, one day that, you know, whatever that, you know, that famous speech was. And I used to remember that speech verbatim. And I would never get to play Martin Luther King because there was a boy in my school that looked like Martin Luther King. So I would go in there and I would audition, like I would just give my heart, I would just like do the whole thing. And they would be like, congratulations, Marcellus, you're Christmas addicts. And I would be like, I don't <laughs> want to be Christmas addicts. He dies in the first scene. Like, and then they'd be like congratulations, you're Frederick Douglass. I don't want to be Frederick Douglass. He has to wear a gray wig the whole time. But it gave me this whole like sort of like um this range, right? Like I played Joseph Sinkyu, who was like a slave that like led a revolt and he wore a cape. So I really liked wearing playing Joseph Sinkyu because he wore a cape. He had a he had a sword and he had a crown. But I really wanted to be Martin Luther King because no matter what, every single play, Martin Luther King would come out and he would give that speech and black people would jump up and like applaud. <laughs> I never got to be Martin Luther King. <laughs> so, but I think that that shaped this desire to yeah. be an actor and to want to perform and want to maybe even control my narrative and how I was seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And as you started to go through you know, high school and then moved into uh, being a waiter downtown Chicago, being discovered... Now that you are in this phase of your life, you're currently living in Los Angeles. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I live yep. in LA. And since we've, since you started modeling and since, you know, a hundred years ago and we were doing all of that, you've worked with some of the best photographers in the world. And now you've transitioned now into the world of styling and you've um, written these three books and you also have your own, uh, is it a docu-series on YouTube? Yes. Yes. Yeah, let me tell, yeah, share with us a little bit about this journey and some of the things that you're incredibly proud of, including these three books that you've uh, just written. So I always say that, um, so now I'm this best-selling author and I have three books. It's this Supreme series of books. They're the first ever art books to celebrate um, Black women, right? And it's such a, it's literally all, it's my whole life is these books. It's growing up at my grandmother's house and having to get the encyclopedia when I would ask the most basic question. It's reading, you know, magazines like Ebony and Essence and um, Jet and, and, and the occasional issue of Vogue or, or Mademoiselle when a black person was on the cover. Cause that was my grandmother. She went to a magazine shop and she saw a black person on the cover. She was gonna buy it to support. My mm -hmm. mother was like that also. Um, so that was, you know, this impetus and loving movies back then. Um, and then, you know, going through high school, working in fashion, loving clothing, fashion saved my life because you know, I was uh, the breadwinner for my family and I made a lot of money at a very young age. And that changed the way I felt about a lot of things. I could have very easily gone to college, but instead of going to college, by the time I graduated high school, I was managing a clothing store. Mm. So I was used to this idea of making money, of living better, right? And then when, um, then when I started, then I decided to be a, 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 a then I decided to, uh, to get out of retail, I started working in bars and working in restaurants. And I always worked at the hottest restaurants in Chicago. And Chicago, that is like theater. You know, a Friday or Saturday night at a happening restaurant in Chicago is like the hottest ticket in town. You know, the richest people in town are rubbing elbows with club kids and models and, and athletes. You know, I worked at Marche and I worked at Vivo and I worked at a bar called Shelter back in the day. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these incredible people would come in. 
you know, you know, that was when the Bulls were like the Bulls with Michael Jordan and Scotty yeah. Pippen, and, and that was when Chris Chelios was on the Blackhawks, and I knew all of them, and I knew George Clooney, and I knew um, uh, David Schwimmer, you know, from being an actor, and like, and and um, Billy Corrigan from um, from the uh, Smashing Pumpkins. Pumpkins. Yeah. And and then and then all these like top models from Chicago and then models that would because Chicago used to be a very good market. So top models would travel into Chicago to shoot with Victor Scribneski. Mm -hmm. And I was a Victor boy a little bit. And I'd be at the studio and there would be, um, you know, uh, uh, Iman, you know, or he had just shot Iman for the Chicago Film Festival. So you felt like Chicago had this like infinite, these infinite possibilities. And you felt like when you worked at these restaurants and these bars, you felt like you were a part of it. You knew these really rich people and you knew these really yeah. hip people. And that segment of society embraced my gayness. They were like, oh, mm -hmm. here comes Marcellus with all that attitude, you know, <laughs> or here comes Marcellus, you know, like I'd walk up to a table and everybody would, you know, I'd walk into a room and people would be like, hey, handsome, da 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 da, and, you know. Um, so by the time I got to the place where I was like, now I'm going to stop working and I'm going to work part time and I'm going to go out and I'm going to try to become an actor. And then I got this. And then along the way, people, photographers would always say you should be a model. So photographers were always trying to shoot me back then. And I had shot with so many people before I was even really a model. But I considered it an acting exercise or I was doing a friend a favor. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. You know, just tell me where to turn up. And all of these things became like roadmaps or stops along the road of my life that were interesting and I loved, and they kept me from falling backwards. They always pushed me forward. And I might not have gotten as successful as I wanted to in those worlds, but I was somewhat successful. And I would bank those experiences. You know, I remember being a model and going to, to New York for the first time and going on rounds mm -hmm. and, and being told by agents, oh, we already have one black boy or we have two black boys. We don't need another black boy. And then you'd look at the board and they'd represent like 200 models and every iteration of white boy possible. Yeah. But in their world, they only needed two black boys or one black boy to do every single thing. And that made me want to be a model even more because when you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to prove to you that I can. not mm. Right. Yep. And then I was around all of these people in fashion, these girls that were being told the same thing and we would commiserate with each other. And I banked those stories. You know what I mean? I remember being in Milan and going to an Armani casting and they made you take your shoes off. And there was like a line across the wall. And if you weren't that height, you they literally pulled you out of line and told you to go. And I wasn't <laughs> that height that got released. But I also remember, you know, going to a Brioni casting with a friend that wasn't my casting. And the people from Brioni like saw me and they were like, who are you? And I was yeah. like, oh, I'm Marcellus. I'm here with da da da. And I yeah. got the job and he didn't. Yeah. And then and then I became a fit model for them while I was in Milan because they were so charmed by like this like black boy from the south side of Chicago, you know, and they had these ideas about Chicago. They literally thought Chicago was like gangsters. They were like, oh, gangsters. Da -da 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 -da. And I was like, what are you talking about? That's like the 1920s, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um so many stories. And then, you know, from Modeling, I became a stylist. I hated styling, but my first job as a stylist was like British Vogue, and it was a cover in six pages. And it was the guy that shot, uh, that was shooting uh, Eternity with Calvin Calvin Klein. It was mm. um, Norbert. Um, and Warwick St. James was the great photographer who was shooting that. And, um, and then I became, you know, from there, a girl from Chicago, a woman from Chicago who I had modeled with had moved to LA and she became a casting director or, or you know, she became a producer mm. and she worked for the same company that was doing Big Brother. And she, they couldn't find a black person, a black guy that they liked. And they asked her being black. And she was like, do I know a black guy? His name is Marcellus, he's a model and he's gay. 
And that's how I ended up doing Big Brother. And I became the first ever out gay black man to appear on a major network reality show. So I say sometimes that I was like Forrest Gump. You know how in the movie Forrest Gump, he was always at the right place at the at the right time. Yes. <laughs> so I Forrest Gumped my way through a lot of things to get to the point where I am now. And all of those experiences became these beautiful, best-selling art books, you know, that, that tell the stories that I, that I heard firsthand. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the book. So it's Supreme, Supreme Sirens is the latest one. Right. So the yes. books have like these long, long, elaborate titles. The title of the book is the is Supreme Models. That's the first one. But then there's a secondary title, Iconic Black Women Who Revolutionized Fashion. That's the first book. Mm-hmm. That book is still a bestseller. It still continues to sell to this day. That book came out in the fall of 2019. Um, Veronica Webb wrote the foreword. I interviewed everybody. It's got it's got photographs by Stephen Mizell, um, um, Emma Summerton, uh, uh, Scavallo, um, <clears throat> and Demarcel a- Yay, Jill Spence, Jill Bitsko, this and is their coffee, coffee tables. Table. They're oversized, yeah. beautiful, heavy. I think each book has like about two hundred and fifty pages, and its photographs are the most famous black most famous black models. And it's actually an encyclopedia of black female models. Okay. And that's bringing my grandmother the right there. Yeah. And, you know, it's everyone from like Donielle Luna, the first black woman on the cover of any Vogue to like new girls, like Anuk Yai, who's like probably right now the biggest model in the world. Um, and Precious Lee and, and, and Beverly Johnson and Tyra and, and Naomi and, um, and Iman, of course. And then uh, jumping forward a little bit, Supreme Models did so well that I did a documentary um, on it, and I partnered with Iman, the legend, which is so funny because I was obsessed with Iman when I was a little boy. So to partner with Iman on something and to be able to like pull out my cell phone and like I'm like let's text Iman right now, <laughs> like, it's so crazy. Um, um, and so Iman and I. Uh, created Supreme Models, the documentary. It's a six-part uh, documentary that lives on Vogue's YouTube channel. So it's not just wow. YouTube, it's Vogue, darling. Oh, right. um, and that was Iman. That was Iman. Iman really wanted it to like be on YouTube because a lot of the streamers made offers when we took it to market mm-hmm. but she didn't want it to live behind a paywall. She wanted to, She wanted whoever wanted to hear the story of the black model to be able to hear it. Amazing. And that was very smart. And I'm very grateful to her for that because I wanted it to go on Hulu. <laughs> um, but Iman really was like very clear on that. So when YouTube kept coming back, she was like, yeah. no, let's go with YouTube. Amazing. Then the first book was successful. And then the second book was Supreme Actresses, which is my baby, which I don't think gets enough love. Um, Lapita, um, Viola Davis is on the cover and Lapita Nyong'o is on the back cover, which is so crazy. I've got two Oscar winners on the cover of my book. I interviewed Lapita. Um, I, uh, interviewed, um, Gabrielle Union wrote the foreword. Amazing. Um, I interviewed, uh, two of the Barbies before they were Barbies. I interviewed Issa Rae and Alexandra Shipp, Sanaa Lathan, um, God, the, the list of people I interviewed for Supreme Actresses was like crazy. Because okay. they're not just art books, they're actually really an encyclopedia in a weird way. So it's the history of the model or the actress, mm-hmm. how they got their start, the awards they've won, their accolades, and then when possible, there's their story in their own words, which mm-hmm. I think is really important for people of color because so often our narrative isn't our own. And it's not maybe told in the way that we want it to be told, mm-hmm. right? And so I think these books are really important because of that. Um, the latest book is Supreme Sirens, which is doing very well. Um, Missy Elliott is on the cover. Um, Monica from the like '90s um, wrote the foreword, which was in- really interesting because the way I write the forewords with each book is. I do all the interviews I can with as many people as I can. 
-hmm. And then the interview that resonates the most with me as the, as sort of the, um, the mission, the meaning of the book, what I want the reader to really take carry away with them, that's what becomes the foreword. And so then I go back to that person and I'm like, listen, I'd love to make your interview the foreword. Can we work together to tweak this a little bit? And mm -hmm. usually they say yes. And <laughs> so that's how it becomes the four. And Monica's, Monica's interview was so powerful and she caught me at a time that was just so right with me because I was struggling with this book because I wasn't getting the uh, traction from the subjects that I thought I should be getting. And um, and at the end of the interview, Monica was like, um, are you on your knees? And it just so happened that I was randomly on my knees doing this interview. And I was like, yes. And she was like, I'm going to get on my knees and we're going to pray together. And so we sat there and we prayed together. And then at the end, she was like, stay the course. And I was like, OK. And she was like, stay the course. And I was like, OK. And she was like, stay the course. And she wanted me to repeat, stay the course. And then I started repeating, stay the course. And then she was like, God has been telling me to tell you to stay the course. Mm. And so that was the thing awesome. I needed to push through to make the last book. Cause I do think this is the final book in the trilogy. Okay. So that's yeah. awesome. And to see your vision and to take all of your life experience um, and be able to put it into something like this is it's it's not easy. So many people have ideas of actually doing some something like this, but it's all about the execution and for you to actually put this together uh, and actually have it out in bookstores. And uh, someone was asking where we can buy these books, Amazon, pretty much anywhere where books are are sold, right? Of course, I, you know, a lot of people hate Amazon. I actually love Amazon because Amazon has done very well with me for, with the books in a lot of ways. Um, it's just accessible. You could order it today and maybe even get it tomorrow. Of course, I would rather you go to your neighborhood bookstore and buy the mm -hmm. book. Um, that's twofold because um, as a Black author and as a LGBTQIA plus author, and as an author who writes book books about Black people, mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you a little story. One of the first interviews I did even back in 2019 for Supreme Models was with Vogue. And the, uh, the writer said, so you wrote a Black book? And I was like, no, no, I didn't write a Black book. I wrote a book for everyone. Mm -hmm. The topic just happens to be black women. But if you are a fan of fashion, of photography, of art, of clothes, of black women, then it could be for you. Mm -hmm. And so I've run into that, unfortunately, that thought process. Oh, because the topic is a black is a is black women, the book is a black book. No. If I pick up a book, if I put pick up um what is it? Uh, 12 Years of Solitude, I think, um, by Marquez. Does that mean it's a Colombian book because he's a Colombian author? No. Any book is for anyone if they're interested in the topic. Yep. And so I have been told in bookstores that they don't carry my books because they don't do well with Black books. Well, maybe that's because you're not putting Black books front and center. Or maybe you're not introducing these Black books to your audience. So I say to people all the time, if you have a favorite bookstore, go to your bookstore and order the book there. And maybe that bookseller will look at the book and they'll go, oh, I should get more than one copy of this and I should stop this book. And I say that to, I say that to um, white people because there's all these historic black bookstores, right? And go to a black bookstore because they probably carry books by every author. The owner is just black. And if you go to a black bookstore, you can order the book you're interested in and you'll be helping that black bookstore stay in business. So there's all these like things that, you know, as this like sort of black author now that I am um, educating myself on and educating others on. But yeah, buy it from Amazon. <laughs> But the thing with 
Amazon is they underprice everything, right? So like, um, my books aren't very expensive in comparison to their contemporaries because darling, my book is the contemporary of the Tom Ford book. My book is the contemporary of the Rihanna books. My book is the contemporary of the Vogue uh, covers book or the Vogue music book. In fact, the Vogue books are published by the same publisher. So one of the reasons why I write these books is because I want little black girls or boys or that gay boy that loves fashion and loves women and loves clothes to be able to walk into any bookstore anywhere and look at the $150 Tom Ford book and dream. Mm -hmm. Look at the $225 Rihanna book and dream. Yeah. But then go over and buy my book for $50 a you know, a fraction of the cost and still feel happy and empowered yep. that they bought something that is populated with people that look like them. Yeah. That tell stories that resonate with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I think your, your internet is cutting out a little bit. Are you, uh, mm. is it, is it okay on your side? Looks like it's, it's okay on my side. Can you see me? Yeah, it's just a little fuzzy, but uh, I think we're okay. Uh, okay good. I wanted to just chat about the concept of what is what people think is beautiful, because you know, obviously, when we think of models, we think that there are some people may think like, well, there's no way that I could be a model, or even when I talk to people who are um, interested in becoming actors or actresses, a lot of the times I hear people say, well, I'm not good looking enough, or I, you know, I don't. I, I'm not uh, I'm not pretty enough or I'm, I'm not beautiful enough to be an actress. And I think we sometimes get stuck in these ideas of the stereotypical idea of what is beautiful. Um, what would you say your I, what your definition of what is beautiful? And because I've worked with some of the most beautiful women in the world, um, not just from the perspective of, of how they look physically. I mean, I've worked with you know, Giselle, and I've worked with Naomi Campbell, and I've worked with some of these top fashion models. But I will say this, there's something more to them that is that accentuates their beauty, and it's more so from the inside. And it's the more the, the way that in which they carry themselves similar to I think how you were talking about, where your grandmother said, just be magnificent. And I've, I've worked with, you know, a lot of actors as well. And I think What's surprising is a lot of people have insecurities about how we look and how we sound. And even the you know top A-list actors out there in the world, my acting teacher um, was Nicole Kidman's acting teacher. And she would just say how uh, Nicole would always talk about how uh, she was never going to work again. That was the worst performance. And she was just like, oh, my God, this is like I, I'm a horrible actress. And so I think we all tend to look at people up on a cover of a magazine or in a movie and we think, oh, well, they must have, you know, they must have just been blessed with the, the beautiful gene and life must be easy for them just because of the way they look. And it is not that way. It is so much more so what you believe about yourself and believing that you're beautiful on the inside, regardless of what, you know, a magazine may say about what is beautiful and what is not. Uh, I just want to hear your insight on what your what you believe is beautiful about someone um and how deep that goes beyond just surface level um well i think what funny is this idea of like being black in america right black in america you're never told that you're beautiful your skin is too dark your nose is too wide your lips are too big your hair is too nappy right <laughs> And then through the history of slavery, um, black people grow up with this, all these isms about, about uh, their skin color. The lighter you are, the better you are, right? Mm -hmm. And so I definitely grew up with that. I grew up like with this idea of like, even in grammar school, I was like the fourth or fifth most attractive boy in, in, in my grammar school class. And I mean, talk about rating like that, like that's crazy. And the most attractive boy was like this guy that was like super light skinned with green eyes and blondy brown hair. Mm -hmm. But to me, he wasn't that attractive. But because like black people value that, or then they did, 
that was like a thing. Good for him. I loved being brown. I loved looking like my mother. I thought my mother was beautiful. Um, and even in fashion, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about this idea that there was only space for one. Yeah. And then, you know, fashion uh, so often would pit us against each other. You know, I remember, um, uh, you know, everybody knows the Tyra versus Naomi, you know, thing. Um, everybody know, you know, there's, and then always like that. It's Iman versus Beverly Johnson. Then it's Tyra versus Naomi. There's only always in, in white societies, there's only space for one black person, right? Mm -hmm. And then because, and then as the black person, if a new black person walks into your space, they're automatically competition. That was something I never fell into, thank God, because I grew up being, um, bullied, I was always open to being friends with everyone. Like that was something I've always wanted to be. Yes, I would be in Miami <clears throat> and when Tyson would walk into a room, I'd be like, damn it, what are you doing here? Or, um, um, you know, Tyson was never my problem. Uh, Tyson actually, actually helped me in a lot of ways because when Tyson hit, like after, Tyson hit just after I did, and he kind of opened the door for this idea that black boys that were really black could be cute. We didn't have to be light skinned and have green or blue eyes. Mm -hmm. And I was combating that early in my career. Um, so when Tyson came in and he was like, you know, black with the lips and like the bone structure, everybody wanted that type of boy. The same was the same with like, let's say Naomi when she hit in fashion. Everybody wanted to use more black girls when they hit. It opened the door for a more expansive idea of what black beauty was. Um, but in terms of what your what you would say is your definition of what is beautiful, what would you say? I think I think for me, everybody that we've mentioned, every name we've mentioned, and we've gotten, we've each had the opportunity to work with these people or know these people socially. Um, Every person that we've met has something that's a little bit different than everybody else. And I think it's charisma, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually think that you can fake charisma. I think um, charisma is a combination of desire, of wanting something really bad, and being able to work for it. Charisma is this wonderful idea of being open to everyone the most successful people in the world, especially in fashion, you talk about Naomi Campbell. Naomi will work a room. Yes, she might be difficult, but within that difficultness, she is working that room. She is charming everybody in that room. Even when she's being difficult, people are like, oh my God, hit me with the phone. <laughs> you know, somebody like Cindy Crawford, I've known Cindy Crawford since like 1997. Cindy Crawford is the person that like walks into every room and speaks to each person in the room. And she looks mm -hmm. you in your eye and she makes you feel like she asks questions about you and she makes you feel so important. Yep. You know, somebody like Christy Turlington, who I'm still friends with to this day and I worked with and, and I love, um, Christy has that thing. Like she just bowls you over with her kindness, right? There's something really, I think the people that are the most successful are the people that have that charisma and they're willing to share that charisma and you feel their aura, you feel their power. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know? Yeah, that's definitely something that is what attracts us. You know, physically we may be attracted to someone, but that only lasts so long. There's so much more... Uh, so many deeper ways that we can connect with people. Um, and that's why whenever I'm uh, teaching any of my acting classes or any of the, the courses that I talk about in terms of how to connect with people on these deeper levels, the way to become more attractive and more magnetic is, like you were saying, to pay attention and to show interest in other people. That makes you infinitely more attractive just for your interest in showing interest in who someone is, what matters to them. Um, and that's definitely something I, I had the privilege of working with Cindy Crawford actually for GQ magazine. Um, and she definitely, uh, she definitely had that aura of being a supermodel, but she just had that, that very similar thing to you where 
very kind, looked you in the eyes, I actually bought flowers for her, um, hoping that I could <laughs> score a date with her. But unfortunately, that didn't work out. But because uh, of Randy, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I, uh, mean, I think you know, fashion is so funny because the most successful models aren't necessarily that attractive. It's a trick of the camera. It's yeah. how you photograph. It's how you move your body. It's how you. It's how you um, relate to light. And, you know. So so often these girls more so girls, I think, than guys, aren't necessarily the pretty, they're not the homecoming queen. They're not like, you know, the head cheerleader. They're probably the girl that was like, you know, that was awkward and gawky back then. But, you know, that's the trick of fashion. They become beautiful. Someone like, a, uh, a, a, you know, someone like Aaron O'Connor from back in the days when we were doing that. Those girls weren't necessarily like the girl next door, great beauty, but they had that thing. They mm -hmm. still had charisma. They still knew um, what they wanted and they were able to create this like fallacy of beauty in some ways, right? Um, you know, sometimes believing you're beautiful when you're not goes a long way towards making <laughs> you beautiful, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I believe there's something beautiful about everyone and uh and oh you're you, sweet <laughs> you but it's true when, when you can shine a light on what is beautiful about each person um and just help them magnify that and see what's what's uh what's great about that person it definitely um you're that's absolutely I, right there, there is something beautiful about each person maybe you're not going to be a model maybe you're not going to be an actor. And I mean, the most successful actors aren't necessarily the most beautiful. You know, mm -hmm. what about character actors? You know, one of my favorite actors ever is Philip Seymour Hoffman. I wouldn't call him like the most handsome guy in the world, but every role he took on, he was able to inhabit that role yep. in the best possible way. I yep. mean, um, everybody, you know, I think a story that every actor should know is Meryl Streep being told she was ugly when she auditioned for King Kong, which went to ultimately Jessica Lange, one of the most yeah. beautiful actresses ever. But Meryl Streep is like one of the great beauties of all time, you yes, know? Exactly. So it's like, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Did that hurt when she was told she wasn't pretty enough to be in King Kong? Right. I'm sure it did, <laughs> but she had to pick herself up and she had to keep going. She had to believe it, yep. you know? Yep. And speaking of movies, Mr. Marcellus, I would like to ask you your six favorite film-related questions. Are you ready? Okay. Yes, I'm ready. All right. First question is, what is your favorite movie of all time? Mahogany starring uh, Diana Ross. I mean, seeing Mahogany for the first time changed my life. I was like, Black people can go to Rome? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what is that movie about? I haven't Diana seen Diana Ross plays a model named Tracy. What's her? Uh, her name is Tracy. I used to remember her last name too. I have a poster in the background of Mahogany to this day. I don't know if you can see it. It's just out of the poster for Mahogany is in my is in my is in my um, living room. Okay. Um, she plays a black girl from the South Side of Chicago who wants to be a fashion designer. She gets. She works at Marshall Fields. A famous photographer comes to Marshall Fields to shoot the campaign, and the only model he wants to shoot is Diana Ross, and she's not a model. The director of the store comes up, and he's like, you can't shoot her for this campaign. She's Black. And he was like, she's the only person here worth shooting. And he tells her, you need to get the hell off of the south side of Chicago and come to Rome, and I'll make you a model. And in a leap of faith, she goes to Rome, and he does what he says he's going to do. And he renames her Mahogany. Tracy Lord. No, Tracy Lord is um, the Philadelphia story. Tracy Chain. Mm, Tracy. Because her, her clothing line is Tracy of Chicago. Anyway, <laughs> Diana Ross goes to Rome, becomes a big model. He renames her Mahogany. She still wants to be a clothing designer. The photographer turns out to be crazy, a psycho, and is like stalking her, but she doesn't really realize it until he's too late. He drives off of the bridge with her in the car. He dies. She Don't gets tell us. You can't oh, oh, movie, bro. <laughs> it literally changed my I, I, I 
actually say to people sometimes that Mahogany made me gay because I was way too young to see that movie because all of a sudden I was like, I'm going to be a model and I'm going to live in Rome. <laughs> mahogany. Well, I think you've given us mahogany. enough uh, to want to check it want us for want us to, to check it out. So um, love that. And second question is, what is your favorite movie or what was your favorite movie growing up as a kid? Um, I loved Breakfast at Tiffany's. Mm. There was something mm. about Audrey Hepburn's character, Holly Golightly and Breakfast at Tiffany's because yep. she came from, um, she came from like, um, like Little Rock, Arkansas. She came from like the South. She came from nothing. Mm -hmm. And she ended up in New York and made herself over into like this like model slash actress. You yeah. know, she was a little girl with a dream. Yeah. Um, uh, there's something about like running through a briar patch and stealing turkey eggs where she grew up. And it just like, I always love those stories of people that come from like nothing or mm -hmm. humble beginnings and somehow make it to the top. And so for years, like the Breakfast at Tiffany's and Holly Golightly, that character in particular, were like, I'm going to get the hell off of the south side of Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. And what I loved about Breakfast at Tiffany's is that uh, those just the, the, the vibrancy of the colors in the 60s, Technicolor, um, everything just seems so glamorous and beautiful. Yes. And just like, yeah. When Love. she comes out of the brownstone and she whistles, and she whistles, but she's in like Givenchy, it's <laughs> like such a moment. And don't you, didn't you go to New York the first time and think that everybody was going to be like wearing suits and you'd be able to like whistle and get a cab and a cab would just fall <laughs> up in front of you? Like, I actually was that gay boy that actually very early in the morning took a taxi to, to Tiffany's. Really? I did that. One of the first times I went to New York, I did it. I'm not ashamed to say it. That's how impactful that movie was for me. Yeah, definitely set uh, some iconic images for uh, for New York. Uh, favorite comedy? Um, I think I said The Holiday. So you wrote The Philadelphia Story. Oh, yes, I did. Comedy. And then romantic comedy, you have the holiday. Well, you just blew the you should have you just blew it for me. So now I'm like, okay. So yes, out, I love the Philadelphia story. I don't know if now we consider that a comedy, but when I first saw it, I thought it was a comedy because of the dialogue. Mm. I mean, of course, it's like the great Cary Grant, it's uh Jimmy Stewart, and of course it's mm -hmm. the incredible Catherine Hepburn. And the way that Catherine Hepburn would deliver a line and the way that she sat on certain words mm -hmm. um and then there's and then there's so many crazy characters in that like the little sister is like wacky and the way she comes dancing into a room every single time because she's like in on the joke um just it's it's got that like kind of crazy slapstick that i love and nothing is better than those comedies from like the 40s you know like yeah. it happened yeah. one night you know like mm -hmm. the, like the, the philadelphia story I just love dialogue and I love it when it's yeah. like a little witty and it makes you yep. think and everybody's trying to one up each other. Yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah. The Philadelphia story. Yeah. I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch that. Um, favorite male actor or character in a film. Well, now we have to talk about the holiday cause that's okay. my favorite romantic comedy of all, all right. time. Yeah. Um, it's an awful movie, right? <laughs> it's like not very I haven't, good. I haven't seen it. Who's in it? It's Cameron Diaz. It's um, Jude Law. Oh, it's Jack cool. Black. Christmas movie. Um, yes, I, it's a Christmas I, movie. It, and mean, the soundtrack is amazing. Like that's a great movie. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, you know, I just listed the Philadelphia story, so now I'm going to come after that and the Breakfast at Tiffany's, and I'm going to be like the holiday. But this, like, um, the Cameron Diaz character in particular for me really resonates because for a very long time, I was like sort of uh, like uh, cut off and indifferent from like love and relationships. Mm -hmm. And so, and I was also kind of cut off emotionally. And so when she is incapable of crying, that was definitely like, I'm not, I can cry at the drop of a hat, but um, but I cry it, like, it, it, uh, like, 
I cry at things that happen to other people, but I won't cry at things that, like I won't mourn for myself, right? Mm -hmm. I won't cry for myself. I won't cry for like little eight year old Marcellus that was like going through so much trauma. And so um, that part of her character sort of really resonated with me. And this idea of like being successful and having it all, but still not being able to find a partner res resonates with me. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, and then, you know, there's a little bit of old Hollywood in there with the Eli Wallet character yeah. that- um, Kate Winslet. Oh my God, that Kate Winslet, be, that she, that she sort of befriends it's really and sweet. they live in the hills. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that whole thing. And then Kate Winslet character, Kate Winslet's character I actually love because I've been the boy as a black gay man, I've been the boy that like has felt like, oh, I've dated people that I felt like were too good for me. You mm. know what I mean? Or that uh, or that didn't see me as a real partner. And so when that whole thing with Kate Winslet happened. Um, that Kate Winslet character and how she was going on and on with that guy and taking all his bullshit. I had yeah. been that person, right? I had been that person that's, you're beautiful, you're accomplished, you're, you're kind, you're all of these things. Why doesn't he love me? If I hang out long enough, if I'm nice enough, if mm -hmm. I do more, then he'll finally see me for all the amazing things I am. They never do, but whatever. So like, there's so many, and then of course Jude Law is like, I mean, that's Jude Law when it was Jude Law, that like original, like the face, like at every scene he walks in and the way he's dressed and every yeah. and the way he speaks, it's like, yeah, yes. Well, like, there's Charlie, everything about that movie. English accent, like, yeah, it's, it's a great movie. Love that, uh, love that answer for favorite romantic comedy or romantic movie. And now we are moving to favorite actor. That's so hard for me because I was gonna say like the the legends, right? I could have said Cary Grant. I should could have said Gregory Peck. Mm -hmm. I should have said I could have said Jimmy Stewart. But for me, it's always Brad Pitt because Brad Pitt has that thing. When we're talking about charisma, yep. I mean Brad Pitt just Dude, oozes yeah. it. Yeah. Like when Brad Pitt like accepts an award, I think the performances that he gives when he accepts awards <laughs> are even better than the performances he gives in movies. He yeah. like turns it on and you're just like, he's funny, he's um, self-effacing. He's yeah. like, he seems to be really kind. I don't know what, you know, if what was happening with him and Angelina and the kids is true or not. Mm -hmm. But um, I remember I actually met him in passing one time at an event. And he was like, he just had that thing. He mm -hmm. had the same thing that George Clooney has. They are movie stars. There's a glow about them. Mm -hmm. And Brad was that person also that like talked to everybody. And, I, and his handlers didn't want him to stop. Like it was like that kind of thing. His handlers were kind of like trying to get between him and people. And he was yeah. standing there talking to people and like moving around. And, and I mean, just like, just magnanimous and beautiful and like, and I and there's so many Brad Pitt performances that I love. I love him in Mr. Mr. And Mrs. Smith. I love him in Seven. I love him in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You know what I mean? It's like there's so many like just great roles. Yep. So Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. And uh, last question: Who's your favorite actress or female character in a movie? It's always going to be. I mean, it could very easily be Diana Ross in Mahogany. But it's always going to be Audrey Hepburn and Breakfast at Tiffany. There's just something, the story arc, her, like running from the South and running from poverty and getting to New York and using clothes and fashion to create this character, this life that she wanted it to be. And being this like sort of party girl and being this like um, this rube, but like talking her way through it. And then like meeting the guy and not wanting that guy to be the guy because she wanted to be with a rich guy because she's so afraid to be poor mm -hmm. and, and, and wanting to control her emotions. I don't think Audrey wanted to, I don't think Holly wanted to be in love. I think Holly just wanted to marry well. She wanted somebody to love her more than she wanted to love them because there's power there. Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of, for a very long time in my life, I was like that. 
I would date guys that I didn't really care that much about because I thought it was more important that you liked me more than I liked you. Because if I liked you, then I became vulnerable. And um, and then, of course, the way that it ends. And you're so right about the set design and the styling and the yeah. colors. That orange coat she wears with the mink hat, like everything mm -hmm. she does in that movie is like pitch perfect. But her arc where she like, fixes all the things that are broken and he and george papard's character helps her fix those things mm -hmm. um to me it's just i love that character and i love that it's truman capote and i love that truman capote really wanted marilyn Monroe to do that role and the oh, studio wow. was like no audrey wow i didn't know that interesting and marcellus you've been uh incredibly amazing tonight. I, you know, there's a lot of things that, I mean, we've known each other for over 20 years and there's just so much more about you that I had no idea about. And just to see where you, you know, just hear about where you came from, what you've overcome to accomplish all the amazing things that you've uh, had the, um, you know, that you've manifested and created. And if anyone is interested in finding more about who you are and what you do and more about your books, how can, uh, how can they connect with you? Listen, I spend a lot of time on Instagram. So it's uh um it's Marky Mark on Instagram, but it's Marky like name and lights. It's M-A-R-Q-U-E-E-M-A-R-C on Instagram. And then MarcellusReynolds.com has like links to all my books, um, to basically everything I'm doing. And I, I now have to put up a, you know, I've been on a book tour, I feel like since the first book came out, but I'm on a proper book tour with this book. So I'm going to start putting the dates and where I'm going to be. So if people want to meet me in person and awesome. get a signed book, I'm going to awesome. put that up on the site as well. So yeah, those and two places. selfie with you as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and last question, Marcellus, um, because a big part of uh, what I do is all about inspiration um, I like to ask my my guests, what inspires you? My ancestors inspire me. Hmm. I am very clear on the idea that I am living the dream of the people who came before me. My grandmother would have loved to have seen me on television. She would love to know all the things that I've been able to do because of her. She would love to know that I've figured out a way to be happy and successful. I think about all the people who walked before me that are black and brown and couldn't do the things that I've done, that didn't have the freedoms that I have. I think about all the gay men that lived before me. I think about Willie Smith and I think about Patrick Kelly and I think about people like that, that were struck down because of AIDS before they got to like live a full life. And they opened doors for me that I have happily and proudly walked through. So I think a lot about my legacy. I think a lot about the legacy of others. And I hope that my life is making it easier for the little gay kid of any race that comes after me to live his dreams. And I hope that my life is making it better for the next person of color to live theirs. That's beautiful, Marcellus. And so are you. And thanks again for your time, for your contribution. Um, next time I'm out in Los Angeles, we've got a link up and- uh, yes and uh, hang out some more and just um, love to hear just more about what you're doing in the TV space as well. Yes, oh. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> awesome, man. Well, great to see you. Thanks thanks so much for your time. And uh, everyone, thanks for showing up here tonight and uh, your contribution as well. Good luck with everything, Marcellus. Everyone, make sure you guys check out Marcellus, check out his books. And uh, do you have anything coming up on the TV space? I, um, when I'm not writing, I'm a, actually a casting agent. I just, uh, I cast the Julia Fox Law Roach show, which I love. It's called OMG Fashion. It premieres, I think, on May 6th on E! And it is a hoot. 
It is so much fun. I mean, you know, everybody knows Julia Fox because she's like an actress. She's like a fashion kind of icon. She's Kanye's mm -hmm. ex-girlfriend. But what we've done with this show is unbelievable. We found some incredible design talent and the things that they're creating are out of this world. It's like Project Runway on steroids. It's like crazy. Mm -hmm. It's really? crazy. I'm super proud of it. Awesome. Well, everyone check it out. And again, thanks so much for your time, Marcellus. I'll talk to you soon. Yes, you will. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, for tuning in. I know we went a little bit uh, over time tonight, but there were so many things that I just wanted to uh, talk to him about and ask him and just so much, so many nuggets of gold here tonight. Um, I especially loved what Marcellus's grandmother said about going out and being magnificent and, uh, and his advice about never dimming your light. Um, and then just obviously what he was talking about, what is beautiful about people is their charisma and charisma comes when you are connected to what it is that you love and what you are passionate about in life. So it just, it's all about going out there and finding it, whatever it is that lights you up and whatever inspires you. And don't let the things that in life that you think may be holding you back or what you've heard hold you back because you Heard Marcellus talk tonight about all the messaging that he was getting growing up um, could have prevented him from going out there and pursuing and fulfilling on all of these amazing things that he's been able to accomplish and to fulfill on. And if he had listened to that messaging um, growing up, there's no way that any of this would have happened. So it doesn't matter what people say. It's about who you are, what you love, what you're passionate about. And when you can connect to that that's when that natural charisma just magnetically radiates. And this is where you become absolutely attractive to everyone out there, especially in whatever it is that you are wanting to accomplish, um, whether it's at work or whether it's in relationships, it's more about you believing in yourself and believing in what is possible for you and believing in finding and discovering the things that are beautiful about you and what you are the best in the world at. And I promise you when you do that, you will have more of more opportunities and more people will be attracted into your space and into your energy because that is what life is all about. Life is about energy and the way uh, that we show up in our lives to attract similar energies. And the more that you focus on the positive and abundant things that in life and what life has to offer, the more of those opportunities and the more of those people are, you're going to be attracting into your life. So it is a conscious decision. I know there's a lot of negativity out there in the world, but we've got to just consciously focus on shifting our perspective or shifting our focus from all of the crap out there and all the negativity and consciously shifting it to the positivity and the inspiration and everything that is amazing out there in the world because there's a ton of great things out there. There's a ton of great people out there in the world and it's up to you to go out there and find them and connect with them to uh, make this world a better place. So that being said, thanks again for being here and uh, wishing you guys my best for the rest of this week. And we will see you guys all next time. Take care.